morning and good afternoon to in-house counsel from all across North America. Welcome to In-House Connect. My name is Shai Mahani. I am the CEO and co-founder of In-House Connect, and I'm thrilled to have you here with us today. Thank you for spending your breakfast time or your lunch time with us, and thank you for spending today, the day before, a long holiday weekend with us. I hope you all have a great July 4th, wherever you are. And special thanks, of course, to our wonderful sponsor today, a longtime friend of In-House Connect, Osborne Clark, and our fantastic presenters, uh, Rachel Oakley, Olivia Sinfield, Paul Matthews. And Francis Lewis for putting together a fantastic presentation on global work regulations and the key trends and challenges facing international businesses. For those of you here for the first time, let me give you a quick bit of background. In House Connect started over 11 years ago as a New York City based meetup group for In House Council. Every month, In House Connect would organize, would organize free CLE classes, which were followed by cocktail networking receptions. And every six months or so, we would organize fun and festive networking mixers. Over the years, we've helped thousands of In House Council connect with peers and outside counsel alike. The group was humming along and then of course COVID hit. We couldn't meet in person so we went online and it's been a fantastic, fantastic transition. We've been able to attract a much larger audience of in-house counsel truly from coast to coast and we've been able to feature high caliber speakers like the four we have today who I'm going to introduce in just a few moments. This is our 33rd event of the year so far. So I'm wondering, is this your first IHC event or have you attended one before? Pretty common. We have about 30% new and 70% returning. So welcome to the 30%. Thanks for joining us and giving us a chance and welcome back to the 70%. It's great to see you again. All right. That's my housekeeping announcements. No more. We have a fantastic event today, so let's get to it. Employment law for in-house counsel, um, global work regulations, and the key trends and challenges facing international businesses. So we have four fantastic panelists today. The first panelist, Olivia Sinfield, who is a partner in the Osborne Clark. Olivia has more than 16 years experience of advising employers and senior executives in the full range of contentious and non-contentious issues arising through the, during the employment life cycle, including employment tribunal litigation, restrictive covenants and injunctions, restructuring and collective redundancies, and business critical issues involving board disputes, change management, and discrimination claims. Olivia leads a team of employment lawyers specializing in GDPR for HR advice and runs the GDPR for HR client network group. The next panelist is Paul Matthews. Paul is a partner in Osborne Clark's pensions practice, advising both employers and trustees on all aspects of pension law. His work covers scheme establishment, merger, benefit changes, winding up, and regulatory compliance, as well as the drafting of scheme documentation and member communications with a particular focus on the tech, media, and comms sector. Our third panelist is Francis Lewis. Francis is a consultant in Osborne Clark's workforce solutions sector, specializing in advising staffing companies and other employment intermediaries on all aspects of the recruitment process, contracting models, taxation of contingent workers, liability and insurance aspect, and recruitment slash workforce solutions sector M&A. Uh, she also works with startup and growth online platforms to deal with Employment Agency Act regulation matters, worker status, and payment models. And last but certainly not least, our final panelist today is Rachel Oakley. Uh, Rachel is a UK employee employment lawyer based in Osborne Clark, Silicon Valley, and San Francisco offices. As part of Osborne Clark's international employment team, Rachel supports U.S. headquartered and international companies in time zone with their U.K. employment and global expansion needs. She works closely along Osborne Clark colleagues and local counsel to coordinate cross-border projects, and international employment law issues. Rachel has particular experience working closely with fast growth and household name technology businesses. Um, we are so fortunate to have four of Osborne Clark's best and brightest on with us today to teach us global work regulations and the key trends and challenges facing international businesses. And with that, I will turn things over to Rachel to get us started. Wow. Well, thank you, Shai. And we're really happy to be here. So thank you to you and In-House Connect for having us again. Always a pleasure. So Shai's done an excellent job of introducing myself and my fellow panelists. So I will not go over that, but just a little bit of background about Osborne Clark so that you know who we are. We're an overseas full service law firm. So as you can see from the slide, we've got a number of offices principally around Europe and the main hubs in Asia. And then we have a network of excellent friends across the world to offer full global coverage. In 
our US offices, we're entirely focused on the international aspects of our clients' businesses. So the only thing we don't do is US advice. So I'm located out in the US and with a number of my colleagues, we support US businesses as they take their first steps overseas. And then once they are overseas, helping them grow from there and everything, helping them with everything from their business as usual and business as unusual issues. So we're almost act as an outsourced general counsel type service. So between us, our team in the US and colleagues located in our international locations, such as the colleagues who are joining me today, we offer a full service of all your international legal needs. Right. So that's a little bit about us. And then what are we here to talk about today? So today we're discussing the key trends and challenges that international businesses are facing in the world of HR at the moment. As we've dealt with the COVID pandemic, many companies still grapple with the decision to have employees return to the office or stay work virtual. So this session is really looking back at how companies have and continue to approach hybrid working and working from anywhere as an international business. And while the hybrid working environment has many benefits, it also has some potential legal issues, including navigating global and continue, contingent workforces. So that's also something we're going to talk about today. Then we're going to do a bit of a look forward and look at some other HR topics that businesses are turning their attention to now. So green HR, green jobs and working in the metaverse. So that's enough from me. Let's dive into the detail and I'm going to hand over to Paul, who's going to kick us off with hybrid working and return to office. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And hello, everyone. Yeah, hybrid working patterns and sort of return to the office for you know, two, three days a week are very much now established as the norm for, for a lot of international businesses. So I think we can all agree that the COVID pandemic has probably accelerated by between sort of five and 10 years, views differ, the sort of longer term societal, economic and technological trends uh, that were already in existence. For most companies, that rapid transition to hybrid or remote working provides immediate sort of challenges and opportunities, both for the business and for their workforce. It also exposes the business to new risks. While the pandemic is definitely one of the most significant catalysts for change in the future of work area, it's important to remember it's not the only driver. There are others such as increased use of AI and also increased digitalization of uh, existing tasks. So, so given what we've been through and where we've got to, we therefore have what is probably a, a once in a generation opportunity to sort of reset the relationship between businesses and their workers, uh, both to the mutual benefit, sorry, to the mutual benefit of both. There's been much talk, um, both sides of the Atlantic, about the great resignation, which is a sort of pandemic induced labour market trend in Europe, North America and elsewhere as well, which has seen large numbers of people uh, quit their current role and go in search of other roles. Uh, and while that is definitely happening, we're also expecting to be uh, to see more of a sort of great reassessment where people are looking to take what they've seen throughout the COVID lockdown period and look to reassess their careers, their work-life balance, their pay and their working conditions with their existing employers. Now, in this session, we'll be looking at some of the labour-related risks that international businesses will need to think about in their future of work plans. But we shouldn't forget that as well as the future of work changes, there will be changes to the, the, work, the working environment too. At the start of the pandemic, there were lots of questions about, was it the end of the office? We think it's probably premature to call that, but there is really a, a big emphasis on repurposing office space to make it much more of a collaboration space, a place where ideas can be shared and training can be carried out, rather than simply a place for work. That trend is seen to continue and we expect that to gather pace as real estate leases come uh, to their end, which is a natural point for businesses to consider how they might best operate their real estate uh, platform going forwards. So next slide, please. So part of this great reassessment I mentioned a few moments ago might lead to the introduction of a four day working week. At present, we have a six month trial just about to kick off in the UK for a four day working week with no loss of pay for employees. Sounds brilliant. 
Um, it's run along similar pilot lines to uh, other, other arrangements taking place in Ireland, in the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Now, the pilot's being coordinated by an outfit called Four Day Week Global, in partnership with, amongst others, academics and researchers from Cambridge University, Boston College, and Oxford University. Now, for those businesses taking part in this trial, at the end of it, there will be an assessment. And a key part of that assessment as to how the pilots work will look at well-being and productivity and how those have been impacted by, by the trial. Now, if this trial is successful, it could lead to a completely new way of working, as well as a, a, a really powerful way of attracting and retaining existing talent in an ever competitive job market. Now, for those uh, businesses not taking part in this trial, uh, I'm sure they'll be watching this closely to see how it goes and whether or not this is a trend that they need to take, uh, take account of in terms of their future of work policy. Next slide, please. Let's wait for those to come across. Yeah, now, in terms of health and safety risks, while everyone was working in the office, it was relatively straightforward for employers to uh, ensure they complied with their health and safety obligations. But employers, as you know, have the same health and safety responsibilities for people working from home as they do for any other worker. So as part of the risk assessment required, employers should start considering, if they're not already, how uh, home workers are affected, in particular in relation to stress and whether there's poor mental health issues, how they are using equipment, are they using laptops and computers safely, and generally the working environment. Employers should talk to their workers about their arrangements because working from home may not be suitable for everyone, particularly if there are mental health issues out there or if they simply don't have the appropriate workspace to work from home. So a key action for employers is really to make sure that their risk assessments do cover home employers. In terms of leadership, uh, it's really important that the leadership team buy into and take participate fully in whatever hybrid working arrangement or return to the office arrangements are put in place. It's really important that they lead by example um, and attend training, particularly on managing a hybrid workforce, which I think is going to be very different to require different skills and different techniques to, to simply dealing with a, a workforce that's based almost entirely in the office. In terms of culture, that's going to be a key challenge, I think, with, with these new ways of working. And by culture, we don't just simply mean getting together on a monthly basis for a meal out or a few drinks or something like that. Culture is really implicit in the sort of structure of an organization. It's the norms, it's the attitude, and it's the behavior of, of teams. And it, cult it basically permeates all sort of levels of the organization. Now, how that culture is maintained with a hybrid working model uh, it is, going to be, is going to be tricky. For businesses, and I don't think there are any easy, easy and quick solutions here. But the businesses that are uh, capable of rising to that challenge and maintaining and enhancing their existing culture will, I think, be the ones that, in in the long run. Now, I'm going to hand over now to Rachel, who's going to talk a little bit about diversity, and inclusion, and bias considerations. Rachel. Thanks, Paul. So I think we could really do a whole webinar on DNI strategies, as the importance of DNI is now something so embedded in every company's ethos. So let's for now just focus about DNI, particularly in the context of hybrid working and return to office. So as Paul's mentioned, obviously many businesses are increasingly embracing remote working and are particularly relying on the advances in technology that enable a connected workforce. And this can generate good relations in the workforce, provided the parameters of connected working are clearly defined. The starting point is that DNI really has a much broader reach than creating equity on the basis of, for example, just race, gender, or other protected classes. It's about creating a level playing field for reward and advancement, regardless of any variables. And hybrid working does create new variables in terms of having different and potentially unequal categories emerge amongst employees those in the office and those who are remote. And then layer on top of that the fact that it's quite common for those being remote being more likely to be women or carers or those with health conditions. So if we want to build an inclusive environment, we need to recognize that remote working, in most cases with a heavy reliance on technology and a connected workforce, will bring its own challenges. 
Um, everything from remote team building to video conferencing protocols is going to be perceived differently by people of different ages or genders or racial backgrounds. And home workers can often feel isolated from colleagues and organizational aims and cultures. Mentoring, supervising can be more challenging from a distance and employees sending or receiving emails out of hours can have a knock-on effect on their colleagues. So starting point really with this approach is are we leaving anybody out and rethinking how we take into account everybody's day-to-day -day working experience when establishing remote working processes and protocols. Few businesses have yet to really work through this and kind of create this equity and respect of their processes. And this is largely due to the fact that everybody scrambled to get everybody remote working. And now that this is becoming more of the norm, we're having to really focus on ensuring that this is do, being done properly. So moving forwards, there needs to be a focus on ensuring this level playing field, really by one, kind of reviewing and stress testing all the processes that you have in place to date. So that's everything from recruitment, for example, to redundancy selection and ensuring that your processes accommodate a hybrid workforce and treat everybody the same to addressing those proximity biases by manager, that managers may hold towards per, in-person versus remote working. And we are seeing technology being used in many of these areas to try and combat this. So, for example, the recruitment process is becoming increasingly more digitalized. So often we see managers using online recruitment games to try and help train themselves into positive approaches when recruiting remotely. And we're also seeing AI being used for initial reviews of candidates and applications to remove some of those unconscious biases that exist. If your company has got anything kind of that it's doing to actively promote D&I in your hybrid work plans or policies, feel free to pop that in the chat box. It'd be great to see if anyone's got any innovative, innovative ideas. And some of the other practical steps we're seeing kind of businesses consider include reviewing how people are analyzed and evaluated and assessed. Most companies often rely heavily on peer and manager feedback. Um, so we're looking at how they can ensure that this is more balanced um, with objective data, competency frameworks and assessment models, which means that they're going to be less vulnerable to bias. Um, also focusing on that cultural integration to ensure that those remote working remotely don't miss out on spontaneous moments of connection. So we're seeing a lot more emphasis on team offsites or using town halls as tools to help kind of build team ties and to strengthen that cultural connection. Also really it's about monitoring the advancement between all staff and that's really going to become the measure of whether a hybrid workplace is working and whether it's opened up or diminished the achievement gap. So we'll need to build in and develop methodologies now that assess performance at frequent intervals to make sure that that gap isn't widening. Ultimately, as Paul said, it's going to evolve a lot of different solutions and ideas. Um, but what we're seeing companies who are doing this quite well do is consider engaging and consulting with their employees about the new models of working that they're lo looking to put in place and maybe putting in place trial periods for new models of working and then adjust based on um, the feedback and how they're operating in practice before committing to long-term policies. And that's what I was going to discuss about DNI, Paul, so I'm happy to hand back to you. So, Yes, thank you. Uh, in relation to business protection, it's important, obviously, for, for everyone to make sure that they've got adequate cybersecurity in place to enable remote working. And there's been a lot of work that's been done uh, in relation to that over the, the, the last period, highly linked to GDPR as well. Um, data protection issues are quite key. Uh, that's and my pet topic, Paul, isn't it? It is. So yes, I'm happy I think... to take over from here if you, if you want to do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so thank, thanks very much, Rachel and Paul and to uh, Shai for your really warm welcome today. Um, it's great to join you all. And I have to say this is a really excellent way of filling the really sad gap, gap left in my life since uh, Tim and Emma completely crashed out of Wimbledon yesterday. For any US tennis fans out there, you might be interested to know that Nakashima is currently live two sets up to one on court number 12. But unlike his opponent, I'm going to try very hard in this slot not to drop any balls today. 
So continuing on um, the hybrid working theme and Paul was talking about people protection. So I'm going to swing over to look at business protection as well. Now, the working remotely, both during and after COVID, um, combined with what's being called, and Paul referred to it earlier on in the UK, as the, the great resignation, has raised absolutely loads of questions about how, and questions we're being asked daily about how employers can best protect their business interests in this new world of work. So what I'm going to do is touch on the interplay between hybrid working and business protection in the context of two really important things, data which as Shai said at the start is a bit of a pet topic of mine and secondly back to people and um, just this morning actually coincidentally I was looking at a, a McKinsey survey which said that 90% of organizations internationally um, so a phenomenally high uh, percentage intend a permanent shift to hybrid uh, working models and that I have to say does chime with what we're seeing um, here both in the UK and internationally um, but interestingly, there is a slight disconnect because whilst you've got that really high percentage, what we're really seeing at the same time are numerous back to work security behavior reports coming through, which are all identifying that round about a third of employees have picked up and um, what can only be described as really bad security habits whilst working from home during the pandemic. Um, so just, just out of interest uh, to see whether this, you, this is a shared experience, if anyone has um, seen or witnessed any security issues as a result of employees working remotely or heard anecdotally about any, um, do you mind dropping them in the chat? And we'll have a little look at those. So, for example, I know here um, at uh, OC we've had to put in extra security measures because of an increased number of people um, uh, in, going after us in terms of phishing attacks so that might be something that you've um, experienced in your business so let me see I'm hoping I've got some responses thanks Elizabeth didn't leave me hanging um, increased use of personal electronic devices for work absolutely and that was going to be my very next um, point as well bring your own devices policies um, that leave businesses very exposed Melissa I love the tennis ball thanks very much um, Caitlin, working on public Wi-Fi, um, yeah, com absolutely remote access to corporate networks is one of the uh, main security risk areas we're seeing as well. Thanks, Michael, you're agreeing with me in terms of phishing emails becoming rampant. Danielle, increase in use of VPN. So, yeah, these are all things that we're seeing as well. So I think it's fair to say it is a shared experience across the board. The other, the other sort of security risk areas we're seeing as well are inadequate device and cloud security and issues around passwords and authentication. So fairly basic, fundamental, but absolutely crucial stuff. Now, where we're at now is unless there is a reset, these bad habits will continue. They'll become ingrained behaviours and a bottom line uh, risk issue and actually arguably were there already. So our UK government reported that last year, around about 40% of businesses suffered a cyber attack in some shape or form during the previous year, which, which actually isn't really surprising given that employees were working from home and their homes were beyond the realms of um, our secure office networks that offer additional protection. Now, there's all of that sitting there as an issue, but in addition, we've seen the emergence of data protection risks. Don't worry, this session is, isn't all going to be focused around risk as well, We're going to be talking about opportunities, but there are some risks that have arisen from new working practices and use, as Rachel said, of new tech, um, particularly around the increased use of employee monitoring technologies that we're seeing being used, where they stray from being proportionate and reasonable ways of checking in on the workforce to pretty invasive big brother spying um, and then layer on top of that on the data protection front risk that ramps up when data like people is increasingly moving across borders um, it might be useful actually as well just to remind you probably need no reminding but potential exposure breach of the UK GDPR so we now have our own special GDPR UK GDPR um, can result in fines of up to 17 and a half million sterling um, and in the EU can result in fines of up to 20 
uh, million euros or 4% of annual um, global turnover, whichever is the, uh, the largest. Now, early doors in the, pan in the pandemic, we saw red regulators like ours, the ICO in the UK, make allowances um, for um, pressures the pandemic was putting on international organisations. Um, but it's fair to say that this honeymoon period across the piece and not just in the UK, across uh, the EU is over and regulators are, they're really expecting businesses now to have in place those technical and organisational measures uh, that are needed to ensure the security and safety of data. And what they're doing now is they're reviewing, they've gone pack, they're opening old files, they're reviewing past complaints and they're scrutinising these in the context of um, data security measures that interest national businesses have in place now rather than those that were in place at the time of the complaint during COVID. So, you know, I think it's fair to say pressure is mounting on the data protection front. So in terms of what we should be doing now as we move internationally to um, more permanent hybrid working models, these are the kind of things, easy wins, if you like, that the regulators are looking for. So, for example, making sure that staff are keeping sensitive um, data secure by raising awareness via training and we're work working with clients to, and doing a lot of training programmes at the moment and really tightening up those data protection policies, testing systems and making sure we're protecting against fundamental human errors, as well as really trying to um, encourage top-notch data hygiene practices. We're seeing clients increasingly invest in um, great tech and implement antivirus software, making sure devices are encrypted and adopting remote mobile device management. Um, Another tip as well is ensuring that your organization is responsive to security incidents by the first step is just purely tracking how your data is used. So undertaking a data audit so you know where it is and also deploying an effective cyber incident response plan. And that last piece is often missed out and um, is absolutely crucial as well. It's something the regulators ask to see. And then finally, we'll come back to this later, making sure that your business complies with um, international data transfer rules. Just finally, just to make you aware before I move off data protection, a couple of developments um, on this front, which actually are, are really important if you're doing business internationally. Um, first of all, the UK government has proposed finally post-Brexit reforms to our data protection regime, which if implemented could actually um, be pretty good news for employers and reduce the data protection burden on businesses operating just in, in the UK. These include, for example, a new accountability framework aimed at moving away from what we've seen as being a real tick box exercise, but instead tailoring expectations based on the volume and the type of how sensitive the data is that businesses are processing, potentially removing the need to have a DPO and replacing the requirement for a data protection impact assessment with a more streamlined and um, basic risk assessment tool. So it's one to watch. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get to a point of complete divergence with our e EU neighbours as bottom line we don't want to jeopardise our adequacy status um, which allows for the free flow of data between the UK and the EEA but there's going to be some tweaking around the edges. Um, at EU level as well there's new proposed legislation um, it's catchly called took the majors to come up with this the EU Data Act um, that will govern the use of non-personal data so we're probably straying slightly outside the realm of employment but it's worth watching um, out for at the moment we don't know what the effect and any unintended consequences will be, um, but it's, um, it's bound to have a significant impact as well. So it's a watch this space. Okay, so moving from data risks to people risks, um, we're seeing here in the UK and hearing from our um, neighbouring jurisdictions that this great resignation really is in um, full swing. And as a result, employers across sectors are seeing an increase in employee turnover. And with this trend really does come the need to minimise the risk that departing employees take with them, um, sensitive information, key, key client contacts um, and work um, with them when they leave. So before I move on, I'm just interested to see whether this is something you've experienced um, either uh, in the US or beyond US borders. So maybe if you just can drop a quick yay or nay or a Y or an N in the chat and we can have a little look. Let's give everyone a moment. 
I wasn't quite as high tech as shy with this poll, so um, we're going a little bit more basic here. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, a stream of yeses coming through. I think we're, we're fairly safe to call this, this fluidity of is a trend. I think the, the messages in the chat there support that loud and clear. So when we're talking about um, business protection in this context, what we're really talking about is the protection we gain from restrictive covenants that sit in employment contracts. And what's crucial here is that our changing working practices have impacted on enforceability. So this is something to consider now as opposed to when there's an issue further down the line. So just to give you a, a couple of examples of how this is playing out. So it's pretty standard practice for employers to define restricted cu customers as being businesses that um, an employee has had material significant contact with, say, in the last uh, 12 months. However, where the twist in the tail comes is if that employee was on furlough, last year or has been working reduced hours um, during or as a result of the after the pandemic, this might now reduce that group of uh, restricted customers covered by the restrictions. So employees who had an existing relationship prior to furlough or prior to their hours being changed may not be protected in terms of those customers and the employee could be free to solicit or poach them. Another one to look out for is where often coverage in terms of scope applies to a certain radius from an employee's place of work. And that place of work is defined in their contract as being their office location. There can now be ambiguity where the actual place of work is no longer just the office, but is either home or that mix of office and home. Um, so main message here is restrictive covenants need to be reviewed, potentially updated now. and. As well, um, in the UK, they need future proofing because we're waiting, eagerly awaiting, I have to say, at least uh, Rachel and I are as employment lawyers, the government response to a consultation on restrictive covenants due any day now. But um, obviously, Boris has um, other matters to contend with at the moment. But what we are expecting to see is a real tightening up or limitation of the circumstances where um, those non-compete clauses that I know a lot of businesses rely upon can be used. So you really need to keep a close eye out um, for, for that coming through. And that reflects the position that's already um, in force in other jurisdictions. Again, something else that throws up added complexities is working across borders. Um, the issue there is around overseas enforcement of restrictive covenants. And that needs to be considered now at the drafting stage or at the point um, employees are relocating. And there's really complicated provisions. I'm not going into them now, you'll be glad to hear. But really tricky provisions around choice of law jurisdiction clauses. Um, so we'll leave that for now. But just to give you a couple of takeaway points before I finish off, tailor your restrictive covenants really carefully to specific roles. Think about the legitimate interests of the business and what you're really trying to protect, whether it's confidential information, client relationships, a stable workforce. And then make sure when you're drafting your restrictive covenants that it satisfies if you do have business interests in the EU, their uh, trade secret definition. Um, and you need to be able to show that you've taken reasonable steps to keep that information secret. It's not enough just to think that some um, black ink will um, provide that uh, protection that you really need. Really importantly, you'll need to have any restrictions reviewed by a local lawyer in the overseas jurisdiction where the employee will work. They will have to adapt it to comply with local requirements and also look at whether choice of law could actually be overridden by the uh, local laws that apply there. And then last point, if you think there's been a breach of restricted covenants, you have to act really, really quickly, collect the evidence, don't delay, take advice in the country where the laws govern the um, contract, because there are um, steps that we can take to pull it back fairly quickly. So talking about acting quickly, I'm going to act very quickly now in handing back to uh, Paul to wrap up, I think, on the hybrid working front. Thanks. And this is definitely my slide. And uh, thanks for mentioning Wimbledon. I, after 20 years of going to the ballot, I finally got centre court tickets for Monday. But <laughs> obviously no Andy Murray and no Emma. So I'll probably have a relaxing day. Just finishing off then on the hybrid working and return to the office. From an international perspective, there are massive advantages of getting a one size fits all approach to hybrid working for businesses. And we've been working with a number looking to roll those out um, across Europe and across other jurisdictions. There are risks of doing that. Um, obviously, you need to keep 
clear eye on uh, cultural differences, but there are also legal differences. And one that we've we've uh, seen come up quite a bit, the one that's in certain EU member state jurisdictions, which is the right to disconnect. And essentially that gives workers the right to basically not perform work or attend work matters outside their normal working hours, right not to suffer a detriment for refusing to attend uh, work matters outside their normal working hours and uh, the right not to respond to emails when they're not working. So I mean, these are you know, clearly quite important areas that need proper consideration to make sure they fit within the approach that's taken to hybrid working. Another area which is uh, an interesting and I think still very much uh, undeveloped area is the area of compensation strategy. Now, very much prior to the pandemic, it was very common to have vacation allowances, a lot of people call geo pay, so different pay, same job, but done in a different area gets a different rate of pay. Now, clearly with remote workers and people working from anywhere, that puts a serious amount of challenge on um, geo pay. But in our view, this is something we've been watching for sort of 18 months or so, that it's been relatively slow to see how the market's going to move with regard to compensation strategy. And I think that's largely to do with the fact that there is a still a raging war for talent going on. So people are not um, too keen to mess with compensation strategies. One London-based law firm has sort of raised uh, a, a slightly different approach relatively recently, whereby they said that if, if people don't want to return to the office, they don't have to, they, they can work 100% from home, but they uh, are required to take a 20% pay cut in order to have that uh, work from home. But if they want to stay at 100% pay, then they have to be in uh, three days out of five. So again, that, that caught the headlines um, in the UK because it was quite a, a, an interesting move. And we suspect there's going to be a lot more um, thought around this in the next few years. So some commentators say that in perhaps 20 years, um, all jobs will be sort of geo neutral in terms of their pay strategy. But again, you know, there's a long way to go on that. In terms of planning for return of business travel, one UK issue that we have is obviously different visa and permit requirements now for us um, post Brexit. Uh, but I think I'm going to say nothing more on that at the moment and hand over uh, to uh, back to Olivia actually to talk about work from anywhere models and the immigration issues will be picked up in this. Olivia. Thank you Paul. All I need is an internet connection and that means I can work from anywhere. Now this is something our clients are hearing a lot from their employees. So increasing numbers of requests to work from their chosen place in the sun or in the shade if their chosen place is London. So actually another question out is, is I'm quite enjoying this interaction, are you seeing these sorts of requests coming through, um, whether it's um, at home or abroad? Just a quick yes or no. Yes, quite a few yeses coming through. Yeah, I think that seems fairly unanimous. William, we had a yes and a no. We can maybe pick up with you, William, on that one at the end. And Fred. Brilliant. Thanks for those responses. Um, so what we're seeing um, by way of a response to these sorts of requests, just to get straight to the heart of the matter, is many of our clients opting for a halfway house. So rather than going for fully remote working models for reasons I'll come on to, um, allowing employees to work from abroad for a set restricted essentially period each year, commonly under 90 days, and um, probably most, pop most popularly at the moment is an arrangement where people can work abroad for four weeks per year, but have to split that into two, two week blocks. Very few, I think it's fair to say, are making the much more bold mo mo move to 100% um, flex. And the reason why is because of the legal issues um, relating to social security, employment, immigration, and most importantly, taxation. So just a very whistle-stop tour of these. Um, first of all, employment law and compliance. You know, we, we all need to know and understand what um, employment rights our employees have. It's 
it's pretty fundamental. And generally, the position is that the law of the employee's domicile will continue to apply if the employee is engaged in another country on a temporary basis. But essentially the question of jurisdiction it's a really complicated one involving analysis of which jurisdiction the employee has a strong connection to so it does need to be looked at on a case-by-case basis um, we also need to be aware that in a number of jurisdictions there are mandatory employment laws that apply completely regardless of the governing law of the employment contract. So you just can't get around them and they can impact really important things like the amount of paid time off, uh, minimum rates of pay, the ability to terminate the contract. Also on this point, we need to be aware that where multinational companies don't already have a business presence in the jurisdiction, there might be a requirement to establish a formal legal presence there. That depends on the nature of the activity being undertaken and the work that the employee or employees are doing, looking at things like whether they're engaging with the local market. And then you'd have to obtain local registrations and licenses under local labour laws and have a registered place of business in the country. So a whole potential heap of pain there. Um, taxation, there are the kind of two key issues here. First of all, what we need to uh, consider is whether there is any possibility that the employee who's working abroad could create a permanent establishment, giving rise to a corporation tax liability. And this very much depends on the individual facts of the case and the position and authority of the employee and what they're doing um, ab abroad. But particularly where senior employees are working abroad and can enter into contracts on the business's behalf, the risk is really ramped up. So it's fairly common and what we're seeing are provisions in contracts um, saying that when working abroad, um, they won't conduct, say, local meetings and they don't have authority to sign up to contracts with uh, clients. Second point to consider on the tax front is, of course, liability to potentially have to pay tax in the host country. So for income tax purposes, Purposes. If an employee physically carries out um, duties overseas, then subject to protection under uh, double taxation agreements, usually the other country will seek to tax the income the employees receive for those duties. The fact they work, say, for an employer, a UK um, business under a UK contract and pe get paid into a UK bank account doesn't change that um, generally, but you do have to check the uh, rules of the country um, concerned. And at the same time, the employees may continue to be taxed in their home country if they continue to be tax resident there. So it's pretty nuanced. It's pretty case specific, which is why to avoid having to get into that very detailed analysis, many businesses are playing it tax safe and adopting the approach that I described earlier on. Social security is another consideration. Need to think about the social security implications of the arrangement. It's another complex area, um, particularly following the end of the Brexit transition period. And the social security position will depend upon the nature of the arrangements and the relevant jurisdiction. So will mean you'll need to take advice in the country people are going from and the country they're going to. But the general rule of thumb is that employees will become subject to the social security regime of the country they're working in rather than the home country unless there's a social security agreement they have a certificate certain and or cert, certain exemptions um, apply for example they're on secondment or simultaneously working um, in several eu or eea countries um, Immigration law, Paul promised I'd mention this, so never wanting to um, let anybody down. I will very briefly, though, but, you know, obviously it's fair to say that it's absolutely critical that businesses confirm that any employees um, have the right to work in the prospective host country and for a foreign national to work remotely from a host country we'll need to look at having appropriate entry visas or a work permit requiring local sponsors may be necessary too. There may be additional immigration requirements that apply in the form of a minimum salary threshold depending on jurisdiction 
and or registration with local authorities um, in host countries upon arrival. Um, and actually foreign nationals can be prohibited from working in overseas location whilst on tourist visas. So it's something to be aware of. Um, one tip we would say is if a visa work permit or residence permits are required, you need to make sure you're leaving enough time um, to obtain these and put them in place before an employee starts working remotely. Finally, the, the other considerations, harking back to my favourite topic, data protection. So there's been a raft of changes. I won't go into detail other than to flag them in the, um, we could talk about it in questions if anybody's interested or pick up offline, um, in the EU and in the UK around the way data can be shared across borders and um, changes in respect to standard contractual provisions. I'll leave it there because it is a fairly detailed um, area in itself. Other things to think about and look at employers liability insurance employees working abroad are they covered by your insurance policies it's sometimes overlooked health and safety I think Rachel mentioned it earlier on there will be legal obligations that you owe to your staff when they are working overseas and risk could be ramped up when they're working in places that you haven't been able to conduct risk assessments on so you need to think about how potentially you are conducting remote risk assessments and then finally medical and travel insurance question there again is does this cover overseas working. So that's it from um, working from anywhere models. I think if we move on to the next slide and I am now handing over to uh, Rachel to talk about global and contingent workers. So Rachel and Fran, I think it's over to you. Thanks. Yeah, before we kick this off with the thought process of how do you engage people if you're having a we hire anywhere, um, we were just interested to get some quick poll feedback on how do you engage your international staff so oh we're getting some responses in already so we're going to cover a lot of these topics between Fran and I Fran's going to pick up the first half we're just keen to see where we land on these give it looks like there's a complete mix of how um, how companies are approaching it which is to be expected to be honest no right or wrong answer really Interesting, quite a lot with remote hires, but also quite a lot still using the PEO, EOR, international contractors. So I'm conscious of time. So I think, Fran, if I kick it over to, to you to talk about the first two topics. Thanks, Rachel. And hello to everybody. I've not been following Wimbledon today, but I do have my own celebration on the 4th of July. My American sister-in-law was very impressed when I had my daughter on the 4th of July, so she's going to be eight. So we've got our own celebration, 4th of July celebration. But it's nice to be able to present to you on this day before your long weekend. Hope you all have a, a good one. I'm just going to give a, a very quick summary of the different ways you can engage workers. We've called them contingent workers. That That is a very mixed bag. It typically refers to people who are either not your direct employees or who are working with you, but not um, as an employee of your organisation. And that's that's the, the part of this that I'm going to cover. That could be a freelancer, a contractor, a locum, an interim, an independent contractor, a consultant. There's many names for, for contingent workers. And I can see from the, the poll results that you are familiar with um, engaging people who are not directly um, on your payrolls or your direct employees. So, the, I mean, obviously a lot of uh, businesses have globalized in recent years. And for all of the reasons that we've, we've looked at the, uh, the, so far in this presentation, there's been an increasing number of people moving away from more traditional employment relationship and moving uh, across jurisdictions and the big question is well how do businesses engage workers who are working in uh, a, a jurisdiction or a country that is not the one in which they are chiefly based. I think the the two main options uh, for sort of non-direct engagements is through uh, employers of record also known as uh, POs particularly in the US and clearly, uh, that's a concept that many of you are familiar with and make use of. These, these businesses have grown massively 
in, in the last few years. And certainly in the UK, we're, we're starting to see a, a, a massive expansion in use of these businesses, particularly by um, sort of tech businesses who are looking to very quickly expand into lots of different um, jurisdictions. And I think that's been the main benefit of the employer of record type approach. It can be very quick to establish there's there's lots of um i suppose due diligence that could be carried out on these companies but i think they're they're generally perceived as providing uh, an easy to use service and way of accessing jurisdictions that you don't currently have workers or capability in and they are generally a one-stop shop so you sign up with them they will engage the the worker in the the country that you need them to do the work in and hopefully you assume that all of the employment status um, issues are dealt with and that they're all paid in compliance with the local tax and social security laws so olivia touched on those briefly in her working from anywhere um, presentation but there are a lot of different employment laws depending on which jurisdiction you are working in and generally speaking the employment laws in the local country will take precedence over any um, choice of law in the contract that you may have with with um, your contingent workers with employers of record they will generally purport to employ people in the country in which they're working and you will usually assume that all of those things are complied and dealt with. And I, I, I say usually because, you know, we've looked at lots of these employer record arrangements and they're not all the same. Some of them are far more compliant than others. And the challenge is to work out which ones are and which ones aren't. There's also um, a difference in compliance different across different jurisdictions. So they may well offer full compliance in the more established jurisdictions, but in the less um, tried and tested jurisdictions where the, um, the laws are less clear or where there isn't a large number of workers in those countries, then they may be less reliable. So it, it's really a case of carrying out sensible due diligence on these employers of record to, to do what you can to try and make sure that they, they are complying with what they need to comply with. So that's certainly tax and social security. Are they offering something that, that looks sensible? Are they definitely employing the workers? They're not engaging them as, as sort of self-employed freelancers. Are they definitely employing them? Because that will go a long way to try and reduce any risk you have around tax and social security liability moving to you and occasionally that can move across jurisdiction and it could actually be a, an issue for the um, worker themselves if that's not done compliantly. Olivia also touched on the permanent establishment risk. Um, I think we say here you know don't don't be a, a sort of accidental tourist and inadvertently set up a permanent establishment for your company in a country where you don't have a local corporate presence and you don't intend to have one. Um, and again, that, that's about making sure that the people you are engaging through an employer record are not doing anything too crucial for your business. And there are ways of avoiding setting up that, that, personal, uh, that permanent establishment. So that would need to look, be looked at quite carefully. I think it's fair to say that the more reputable employers of record do recognise this as a risk now. And they expect to... Um, have discussions with their, their clients about it. If they're not acknowledging it at all, I would question whether they're the right employer of record. So that's something to, to look out for. And it is important because you, you need to be careful about setting up a liability for certainly corporate tax and possibly also the required to, requirement to register for value added tax in, in, in the UK and the EU. The other big downside is obviously you don't have control over how these people are working and that's that's going to be the the case for for any remote worker but as an employer of record um it you need to somehow find a way of um conveying what the culture of your organization is to those eor uh, workers 
who who may feel like they're in a completely different category you know what is the culture of your organization how are you going to communicate and share that with them from an immigration point of view again you you need to uh, consider that quite carefully it's not always possible for an employer of record to deal with the immigration of of workers that are working in in the countries in which they're intended to be set up uh, for instance in the in the uk an employer of record may not be um, able to act as a, a, a sponsor for visa purposes so again you would need to to look at the immigration position and make sure what they're offering does actually comply with the the immigration requirements a key one, particularly where you've got um, workers who are going to be working on um, sort of IP related projects is around the ownership of intellectual property. Um, you need to make sure that whatever agreement you have with your employer of record means that the ownership of intellectual property that, that's developed on your behalf does actually get passed to you and does legally vest in you. And clearly that's very important in any kind of tech related um, project that uh, an EOR worker is involved in. Confidentiality, again, is an issue. And I think we've, we've also mentioned data protection a lot. But again, these people are employed as a matter of record by the EOR, but they're not actually your employees. So data protection and the issues that, that go with it also need to be tracked through and considered when um, using an employer of record. So those are just some of the, the sort of key areas that we very often get involved in looking at when we're advising um, organisations who are wanting to use an employer record. And I think the, the, what the sort of key point I'd make is that it can offer a very useful and quick solution on a short, um, for a short scale. But where you do want to operate a contingent workforce on a long a longer time frame or on a larger scale i think you'd have to look very carefully whether employer record was the right solution for you maybe that one of the other solutions that we're going to talk about would be the better thing to consider or or work towards so looking briefly now at um, contractors this this would be um, engaging people as independent contractors um, so they wouldn't be your employees, they wouldn't be employees of, of, of anybody in country, they would be engaged as an independent contractor. So that immediately raises questions around well, what is their status from employment and the tax um, uh, perspective? Are they genuinely self-employed or not? If, if they are, if they are independent workers, you think that they are in, genuinely freelance, then this this is a good option it can be quite quick to establish and there's no particular payroll to set up because you would be paying them on a sort of commercial business to business basis um, sometimes if you go down this route there may be um, a sort of a recruitment agency involved as well which has a layer of complication but there are a lot of staffing businesses in the uk and beyond that do offer the services of independent contractors and we, we get involved in advising on a lot of those arrangements. I think the, the key point there is that, again, it is the law in the country in which they're working that will need to be taken into account. And so you can't just assume that because you've told them that they are responsible for their own tax and that they're not employees, that the local laws will be consistent with that. Um, in certain countries, particularly in places like uh, um, Germany, for instance, the enforcement of what they call false self-employment is, is probably a little bit um, more stringent than it is in, in the UK, for instance. And so the risk in different countries will, will vary in terms of the, the likelihood of enforcement and questioning around the, the status of independent contractors. Again, you've got the permanent establishment risk. The same considerations would, would apply there. So you've got to be careful that these contractors are genuinely independent and they're, they're not um, doing anything to to negotiate on your business's behalf or conclude contracts for you. Um, and I think you also have to be careful about including um, statements on your, your website, for instance, about 
you know, where you've got um, activities and um, business in different countries, if that is being done by independent contractors, again, you've got to be careful not to create this permanent establishment um, issue. The IP ownership and the confidentiality aspects are just as valid uh, and important for contractors, probably even more so because where you've got an independent contractor, there is no employer. There's not even an employer record. So you have to make sure that whatever contract or arrangement you've entered into with the contractors covers off who owns the IP that's developed and how do you ensure that that ownership moves and vests in, in you uh, and, and to be quite specific about what that relates to and what it doesn't. So that, 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 that's a, a key part of engaging contingent workers. I think finally, just to um, probably state the obvious, but where you've got an independent contractor and probably an employer record worker as well, stock options are, are, are not an option. They are meant to be independent. They are not engaged directly by your organisation. And for some, that, that could be an issue. So that's a very brief and quick roundup. I think uh, Rachel's now going to look at the options for direct engagement. Yes, to touch on the other options, um, separate to what Francis was talking about. So here where we're looking at more direct models of engagement, um, obviously these are much more traditional, so I won't go into them in as much detail and you've got the information on the slides. But essentially what we wanted to flag is um, we appreciate it's a process and that having a direct entity, you know, a direct hire via a local entity isn't always going to be practical. But as kind of businesses scale and grow, this seems to be a process and a life cycle that companies go through as different factors become more important. So be it whether you want to bring in com com employees more directly into the fold, whether you're looking to sponsor visas or whether you're looking to offer more um compliant stock options or you're wanting to move away from that permanent establishment risk and being that accidental tourist. So what we are seeing increasing use of is what we like to call the hub and spoke model. So essentially using a non-local entity to facilitate hiring in different countries, particularly in UK and Europe, this can work quite nicely. Um, still has some limitations, as we've said, but Ultimately, it can create kind of more employee engagement and oversight, and you're directly employing that individual. So you will kind of have control over that relationship and more certainty over your confidential information and your IP. Um, things to still be aware of, it still comes with that permanent establishment risk. So by the very nature of having individuals in a country in which you don't have an entity, that risk is still there. And obviously, as Olivia said, it can get particularly higher where you've got senior individuals under that model or even salespeople as well. So one to look out for. And it's often when employees when employers decide that that risk is too great or they're looking to um, or they've got a more kind of critical mass that you know, they transition to the more gold plated standard of having a direct entity and hiring locally in every jurisdiction in which they have employees. But obviously, that's not something that you can kind of get into straight away. Um, as it, that could be a bit of an administrative nightmare, but it does then come with the benefits of recognizing and um, managing the permanent establishment risk because you'll be kind of properly um, in country registered in the appropriate way. And there may be some kind of tax planning that you can do to use intercompany agreements to facilitate a more tax advantageous position. Um, it also means that visa sponsorship is possible because you'll have that direct entity to be able to do that. Um, so it does come with a lot of benefits um, hiring directly and it does kind of alleviate some of those problems that Francis was talking about, about the various other models. Um, so it's, it's a good kind of scale to work through as you are scaling internationally with the direct hire via local entity as that gold plated standard. And then finally, we were going to go on to consider those more future looking topics. So first up on the list is green jobs and green HR, for which I'm handing back to Paul. Yes, you are. Hi. Thanks. So um, 
this is another trend that we are seeing. Uh, um, what do we mean by green jobs? Well, the most common usage is the one that you're probably all familiar with, which is jobs that have a sort of direct positive impact on the planet, where the focus is on either reducing carbon emissions, restoring nature, or making similar environmental improvements. So that's typically renewable energy jobs, highly skilled um, jobs in manufacturing on electric vehicles or other low carbon technology. But increasingly, we're seeing it being used in a slightly different context, which is uh, roles that indirectly support the ambition um, uh, to, uh, to, to impact on climate change. And this has direct relevance to all employers. Um, we see this trend continuing as businesses increasingly have their own net zero targets and, and, and maybe um, ratcheting up those, as well as uh, businesses having to um, help assist with national climate targets as well. Consequently, we see a general awareness that most jobs will become green jobs in that every employee will contribute um, to working in a more sustainable, sustainable way. Um, for example, employers will look to engage environmentally friendly workforce processes and practices and systems. Workers will be expected to have a good understanding of climate change and how their work has an impact on uh, the environment. And businesses and workforces will uh, work together in taking steps uh, to reduce that impact. So we see this as um, a, a very much a trend um, uh, uh, for the future. M moving on uh, to the next slide, and I'm um, slightly uh, moving through things at pace given um, timings. Uh, it linked to green jobs is also a green HR. Um, and there's, uh, I think this is recognition of the fact that HR teams have a major role to play uh, in driving the transition to green jobs because of their um, significant involvement in the policies and procedures and their unique access to people. And there are four main areas that we see um, HR playing a, a key part in driving that, that sustainability agenda. Uh, first of all, in recruitment and selection, so making sure that jobs and personal specifications have sustainability practices and knowledges built in. Secondly, from a performance management perspective, looking to assess sustainability objectives and targets in the appraisal process. Um, learning and development, again, making sure that information about sustainability performance and employee requirements is part of the induction and ongoing uh, learning and development process. And finally, making sure that leadership and um, uh, engages fully in ethical leadership, introducing sustainability role models at senior level, etc. So um, we see that as a, a, an area of focus. And again, speaking to our international uh, colleagues is, is something that is, is, is prevalent in uh, most of our key jurisdictions. Um, just moving on to the next slide, if I may. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through every single one of these um, given times, uh, but in essence, there are quite a lot of legal issues that arise out of um, the, the move uh, towards green jobs. Um, more recently, we've been involved in redesigning of job specs and updating employment uh, contracts, for example, where the move was to uh, ensure that everyone had an electric vehicle, to so phasing out um, anything that, that, that wasn't an electric vehicle as a, as a contractual right. Um, there's lots of restructuring and, and training that's required to transition uh, much more to a green job economy. And we're also seeing um, increasing uh, use of technology and, and regulation around that um, tech. So for example, AI is a really good uh, 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 thing to focus on. I think in the US, there's discussion about having some uh, an, an AI bill of rights. Um, you probably know the position on that but better than I do, but that is that, that that issue is reflected also in the UK, where there's a 10-year strategy out for consultation on the use of AI. And in the EU, there is, a, again, a very um, uh, interestingly named AI Act, does what it says on the tin, um, and um, that is uh, intended to protect uh, people from the, the downsides of, of AI. So plenty to get to grips with there as, as we uh, move towards these new techs. And finally, a lot of this is going to have to be consulted and uh, engaged with the workforce and there's plenty of legal issues uh, around that as well. That takes me to the end of my uh, slot on uh, green jobs and green HR. I'm now I think handing over to Olivia on the metaverse. You are indeed. Thank you 
Paul, and uh, this is taking up to, us up to the end of the session. So just literally in two minutes, I'm going to um, finish off by being a bit more forward looking and touching briefly on what we think is highly likely, if not damn certain, to be our future of work. And that is decentralized um, working from anywhere in a virtual world, which we will inhabit as avatars. Um, now, this, of course, is very much still in the uh, making. And it's, you know, it's far from being decided whether this will ultimately change our working worlds for better or not. Um, but we are we are at the start of that road. So we're traveling from the metaverse being what it is now. So different software providers acting in silos to eventually being this amazing interconnected platform platform that brings work providers together and works as one. So just briefly, what are we talking about when we um, refer to work in the metaverse? It, I think it operates on three levels. So we're seeing or starting to see, first of all, job creation. So uh, specialist jobs on businesses who are working on developing the metaverse, such as metaverse business development managers. Disney have just announced the appointment of a new uh, senior vice president. Um, Vice President for Metaverse Consumer Experiences. So um, that's a, a great old title there. In addition, there's a discussion around creation of jobs in the metaverse. So metaverse stylists are an example, metaverse tour guides. And then the final level, which will probably impact more on us, is where we start to do our jobs or part of our jobs in the metaverse. So for example, attending client meetings. And there are tentative steps already being taken in this direction with some businesses uh, using holo programs um, in company meeting, business meetings. And this all throws up some really, really interesting questions, things like how will our legal concepts apply? Will it completely change our legal landscape? Um, how is it going to work if there are no national boundaries in the metaverse in terms of jurisdiction? Um, how will working in the metaverse interact with working in the real world? Or are the lines becoming so blurred that they um, effectively the distinction ceases to exist? And how will this, and this is probably most importantly from an employment perspective, how will all this impact on our people and what and when do we need to start and prepare? And it links as well to remuneration, which Paul was talking about before. How will people be being paid? Will it be in cryptocurrency? Looks um, at the moment not imminently like it, likely given the recent he headlines volatile nature of this, but for some, no doubt, being paid in this way as part of the remuneration package will be exciting. Um, so it shouldn't be long-term dismissed because businesses now are really looking for creative solutions to um, attract and retain talent. So next slide, please, Rachel, just really briefly some of the issues to consider with um, if you have when we have people working in the metaverse. Mental health needs to be front and centre of any metaverse strategy, because no matter where people are work, um, employers have a legal duty to assess risks in the workplace um, in terms of uh, potential hazards, physical safety and promoting good working practices. And World Health Organization Europe have already flagged this, are already worried about this as being a challenge from a health and safety perspective. So issues like, well, how do we observe regulations on working hours when that move from work life to um, real life to our personal life may not be as clear? Um, what about when we're using ga gadgets such as v VR goggles? There'll be new challenges, be and more occupational accidents potentially because we're using the goggles, we're in a discussion discussion and we're gesturing unaware of what's happening around us in the uh, real world and could cause an accident if that's while we're working an employer could still be potentially liable on the flip side um, and being more positive about it the use of gestures and physical expression might mean it's actually more akin in the metaverse to uh, more human connections um, that we're used to when we collaborate in person so some have actually suggested that this will be a good thing and that work in the metaverse could alleviate some screen fatigue and some of the problems that we've experienced with remote working 
Moving on slide, so upskilling and reskilling. We're seeing a trend towards this um, digital upskilling and reskilling already. And um, the rise of the metaverse will really play into this and supercharge it. So employees are going to need training on um, how to use the metaverse. Employers will have to consider where, how this is going to be provided. Um, will, they, will they outsource this, bring in contractors and all of those issues that Francis was talking about? Or will there be somebody in the business upskill um, an IT specialist who'll become a meta warrior whose job it will be to uh, provide training to the rest of the business. We then need to think about DNI considerations, top of all business agendas at the moment, of course. But for example, when it comes to providing equipment, it's really unlikely there's going to be a legal requirement to do that. But then you think you need to think that we need to be careful not to exacerbate the digital divide when it comes to the provision of equipment that some people may have it in their homes already, others um, not as likely to do so. So all, all food for thought. Uh, next slide, all roads always lead back to data. Privacy in the metaverse is going to be huge. Um, you know, if, if the metaverse is going to develop so that worlds are interconnected and we've got loads of businesses operating in the same space, employers, we're going to have to think really carefully about how we retain confidentiality of information and security of data. And when we come to the, look at issues like employee monitoring, yes, we'll need to know what our people are doing because of that concept of vicarious liability. But we'll need to balance that with people's rights of privacy, particularly given those blurred lines between home and work. Um, Moving on, finally, in terms of employment tribunal claims, the biggest issue here is going to be around uh, harassment. And this has already been flagged as being um, a potential issue at the moment. So you can see a couple of recent BBC uh, articles here, one labelling Roblox as the children's game with a sex problem. And because of these sorts of news articles, and Meta has already actually announced a feature called Personal Boundaries, which halts the movement of someone else's avatars towards you as it reaches as your boundary unless you want to let them in, um, in a move to uh, prohibit unwanted conduct between avatars. Um, I think on the slide or the next slide is the UK definition of harassment and the guidance around this actually specifically references facial expressions and physical gestures as examples of harassment in real life and the same is probably likely to apply to avatars and um, given what we're hearing about the use of VR that for example if someone is close to you and um, it can sound like actually that their voice is talking in your ear which potentially could be pretty invasive and um, there are also development underway that um, to allow people uh, to feel sensations of touch. So interactions are likely to become much more akin to real life. Our laws will have to evolve and adapt accordingly. But basically, and to wrap this all up, until they do, as employers, as businesses, we're going to have to be one step ahead and start to think about and work around these issues. Um, a lot of it will be iterative until the laws um, have do catch up. But this is a real responsibility for employers and an opportunity to really play a part in shaping our future. So on that positive note, that wraps up our session today. Um, as you can see, there's loads of um, issues and things we can talk about. I hope you found it interesting and useful. And we're all more than happy to take any questions or if we don't have time today, deal with them offline as well, because I know that we've um, covered a lot of ground. So thank you very much for bearing with us. And back to you, Shai. All right. Thank you. So first of all, thank you, Rachel, Paul. You know, Rachel, if you don't mind putting keeping the slide up, we'll keep the Osborne Clark contact info there. Um, <clears throat> so Testing thank you. me now. Let me get it back. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Fingers crossed it'll work. But Paul, Olivia, Francis, and Rachel, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. Folks out there, if you have questions, please submit them in the chat. I have a few that were submitted previously. Ah, there we go. Okay, see, got it. So I have some <laughs> questions previously, but happy to take additional questions. So first of all, <clears throat> First question, should language regarding furloughs and reduction of hours be built into the restrictive covenants? I'll jump in on that one. Should language, this is a good one, regarding furloughs and restrictive hours be built in? 
No, not specifically, because the issue there is those restrictive covenants will stay obviously in contracts um, for the next number of years, but at which point furlough will become irrelevant to, um, to those enforcement of the restrictive covenants further down the line. So we need covenants that work now and work later. Um, so we wouldn't refer specifically to those concepts, but we would still look at adapting the more general language, look at things like the duration of the restrictive covenants and the definition of customers to, um, to deal with that issue. Got it. Another question. <clears throat> we, are, uh, we are remote first and have hired internationally in significant numbers, all designated as contractors. How do we begin to get our arms around slash quantify our risks? Um, well, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, that, that is a huge question. Um, and there is unfortunately no no easy answer. I think um, the, the 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 approach I would suggest is is to do a risk review, look at where you've got contractors, what types of work are they doing, what types of roles, where you um, are confident that they would likely to be self-employed um, they're not working in a dependent way they are independent they are um, effectively running their own business then I think you've got um, a, a sort of a less risky group um, uh, but where you've got more dependent workers who are working more as employees or are integral part of your your business then I suppose you you would concentrate on those as the more risky category and work out whether um, engagement as independent contractors is this the best option for you. One way of um, helping to de-risk the certainly the contractual arrangements from for independent contractor arrangements is to set them up on what we call a statement of work basis, and that's where the um, contractor is responsible both in practice and contractually for um, supplying a deliverable to you rather than just their time because um, paying contracts for their time and materials is more likely to create a risk from uh, an employment misclassification or tax misclassification risk point of view. So if you do have people working in roles that can be scoped uh, in terms of a, an outcome or delivery they are charged with supplying to your business, then that type of arrangement will be better um, suited to independent contracting. And it is something that can be used across jurisdictions because um, it shouldn't then be impacted by local employment laws, labour leasing laws, for instance, because it, it operates outside of those regimes. Um, so I, I think it's, as I say, there's no easy answer, but start with a, a sort of risk review, break down the different types of um, contracts you have, the different roles that they're doing, and work out where your, your higher risk pockets lie and, and look at what the options are uh, as alternatives to independent contracting for, for those, those workers. Got it. So I have two more questions in the queue. If anybody has any questions out there, now is, I guess, final call for questions. So the next question is, what is the basis for four weeks abroad as a best practice? I think I'm going to have to take one, that one because I think I mentioned four weeks abroad. So I would say that is it's a guideline, it's not a tram line. So there's no regulatory compliance basis for four weeks. What four weeks does is it falls below that line when of risk when it comes to looking at tax, social security, permanent establishment risk. Um, but for example, it could be six, it could be three, it's for each business to, um, to, to set its own standard. I think four weeks, because it's a month being able to uh, work abroad out of 12, it's, um, it works well when it comes to looking at issues like um, bonus and pay so um, it just seems to be something which a lot of our clients are approach are adopting as an approach at the moment so the last question it's regarding options and the question is so isos are given to people outside of the daily operation of the company such as consultants that said what would you see as business risk of giving iso isos to peo employed international people 
Mm, I think that that that's me again. Um, I I think that's um, it's not it's not an easy one to to sort of quickly answer. I think it would be a case of looking at um, whether the the rules around those ISOs would would accommodate a third party granting those those options um, and how that would work in those jurisdictions. Certainly from a sort of tax point of view and a, a sort of incentives and benefits point of view. I think that's probably the the key issue. Um, but you know, obviously, you you would be creating some kind of option in an organization that wasn't the workers employment employer organization so you you've, you've got um a disconnect between the two and that that's never as straightforward as where you've got an employee who is part of your organization um and, and is going to benefit from an incentive that's issued by the employer organization so it, it, it's just a, a layer of complication i think the starting point is that it's not straightforward to um, arrange for options for people who are not your direct employees. There's, there, there are more um, sort of hurdles and fences to jump over. I think the only other thing I'd add, Francis, if I can, is um, in our experience, what we sometimes find as well is because the international PEO or EOR is effectively the employer of record, so they're the one responsible for doing the any kind of filings or deductions that source or accounting for any kind of tax on those. We have seen some of our clients have issues with their third party organizations, either refusing to do those or failing to do those. So again, as you were saying, Francis, some are definitely better than others. So if, if it is something that your underlying US stock option plan does permit, it's probably worth having a conversation with the third party that you're looking to use because that will fall on them. And if they fail to do it, ultimately that will reflect on you as yeah. the, as, yeah. Yeah, because they're not on your payroll. So exactly. That, that, that's the complication basically, yeah. One follow-up is, is that the four weeks, is it on an annual basis? So do you want to elaborate? And, and I guess, you know, you're still going, you know, answering in the chat. Do you want to just answer the question fully, Olivia? Yeah, of course. So yes, the, the four weeks is in a, um, a sort of rolling 12 month uh, period. And there was a quest, similar question there from Josephine, who said she'd heard about 90 days, which that is top end because the 90 days crops up in um, tax legislation, which is where people will have will have heard that as well. So it's 90 days you wouldn't want to top over, tip over, sorry, <laughs> or top over. <clears throat> All right. So that's all the questions. Thank you again, Rachel, Paul, Olivia, and Francis. That was fantastic. And thanks everybody for your questions and participation.